Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Rebecca Elliott and I am the Communications Manager here at the Doherty Institute. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which I live and work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Today, we're very excited to announce that the Australasian COVID-19 trial, or ASCA, ASCOT, as it's more commonly known, has opened uh, and actively recruiting patients in India. A quick reminder that ASCOT is a clinical trial that aims to discover which treatments are most effective in patients hospitalised with COVID-19 and whether they'll prevent patients deteriorating to the point of needing a ventilator in the intensive care unit. Here to tell us all about it and to provide an update on the treatments being trialled in ASCOT is Principal Investigator, Associate Professor Stephen Tong. He is a Royal Melbourne Hospital Infectious Disease Clinician and co-lead of clinical research at the Doherty Institute. Also with us today is Professor, Professor, Professor Fellow from the George Institute of Global Health, Health Bala Venkatosh. Uh, ASCOT has partnered with the George in Institute to expand into India, where they currently operate in 21 states. Over to you, Associate Professor Stephen Tong. Thanks very much, uh, Rebecca. Uh, and we're really excited, as you've just said, to, to provide today a general update on ASCOT and really three specific things that you've touched on already, uh, this news about ASCOT extending to India. Uh, and then secondly, an update on some of the interventions being trialled in ASCOT, uh, particularly the closing of convalescent plasma as an intervention and the addition of a new antiviral drug called nefamistat. So as a general update, uh, we have recruited now 33 patients in Australia um, who've been randomised to receive convalescent plasma or standard of care without convalescent plasma. These participants were largely from Victoria, uh, but also included those from New South Wales, Queensland and New Zealand. We've been reflecting on, I guess, sometimes the difficulties of recruiting patients into clinical trials and other research uh, during this pandemic in Australia and New Zealand uh, and through the efforts of our public health uh, systems and our communities, we've done an amazing job in keeping COVID at, largely at bay. Um, that's, of course, on the other hand, made it difficult at times to recruit participants which is really the main thing that you need for research and clinical trials like ASCOT. However, we continue to believe in the, uh, the importance of such trials, even with the vaccine being rolled out, uh, there will likely be participants or patients who present to hospitals in the future with COVID, and we still need to determine the best treatments for these patients. At the moment, through trials overseas, really only two treatments have been two or three treatments have been shown to have a particular benefit. So there still is a major gap in our knowledge of how best to treat these patients. Uh, COVID will also continue to cause major issues in low middle income countries. And again, there's a great need to improve treatments in these settings. Uh, I think this is really important as results also from trials in high income countries may not necessarily directly apply to those in low and middle income countries. And I guess we recognised this early on, and particularly with the waning of cases in Australia and New Zealand, albeit with, with spikes now and then, uh, it's become apparent um, of the need to extend our recruitment sites to make the trial viable and allow us to answer scientific questions uh, that we're trying to pose. And in looking for overseas partners, fairly early on, we approached the George Institute and we, we were linked up with Professor Bala Venkatesh. And so today we are really excited to announce the opening of trial sites in India and the recruitment of our first participants in Indian science. I might hand over now to Professor Bala Venkatesh to provide more details about the COVID situation in India and some background to conducting these kinds of trials in India. So thanks, Professor Venkatesh. Um, Stephen, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a very exciting stage to, um, to get the trial going in India. Um, so India's had a big COVID surge um, so in the, in the first wave, um, India had 11 million confirmed infections um, and, um, uh, and with, with peak infection rates of 75,000 new cases per day back in September 2020. Over the next three months, the uh, next three to four months, the number of cases declined. Uh, but in the last two weeks, there are concerns about a second wave in India. 
with uh, case loads rising to as many as 15 to 20,000 infections per day again. And, um, um, and particularly in some of the um, southern states and in the western states in India. And um, I can't um, emphasize the importance of the collaboration with uh, our colleagues in India. Uh, I mean, there is a public health imperative to do this work in India. It's very important. Uh, and uh, the other important consideration, as Stephen, you mentioned, is that um, for the generalizability of trial results, uh, it's important to do the tr clinical trials in different healthcare settings, and therefore the results become more internationally applicable and relevant. Um, and also, India has a um, high prevalence of um, patients with uh, diabetes and high blood pressure, which are risk factors for developing severe COVID-19. So if we are able to identify treatments which will help the population with COVID, then this will, be, this will have a significant impact in a country like India. Uh, and, um, and I think there's also a lot for us to learn from this collaboration. We, um, uh, as clinicians, they have seen far more COVID-19 patients than we have, and they've already participated in large numbers of COVID-19 trials. They have took part in the solidarity trial in India in multiple centers, which was a WHO study. And um, they also led the PLACID trial, which we all know is the first anticoagulant st study in COVID-19, a trial of blood thinning drugs. Um, uh, sorry, a trial of uh, convalescent plasma in, in COVID-19. But, um, but I think coming to the ASCOR, I think it'll be a very, um, uh, we are testing novel interventions there. And we have partnered with um, tertiary centers in India, Christian Medical College Hospital in Velo, which is the largest, um, uh, one of the largest tertiary centers in Southeast Asia, uh, and their sister organization in Northern India called Christian Medical College in Ludhiana, plus a number of other centers um, in the state of Maharashtra, um, which is in the Western part of India, of which Mumbai is the capital city. So, um, and where there is a COVID surge again. So um, I think we, um, this uh, collaboration is important uh, and I'm sure it'll contribute to a huge amount of knowledge in the management of COVID-19 patients in the future. Thanks very much, Fala. Um, Steve, I'll, I'll uh, hand back to you to talk about nefamicide. Oh, thanks, Rebecca. I might just quickly touch on convalescent plasma and what's happened with that. Um, so this is a quick update on, on the interventions that we're actually trialling within uh, the study. Uh, so if you remember, convalescent plasma is, is where patients who've recovered from COVID, they've developed an antibody response uh, to help them to recover. And those patients have kindly donated their own blood and plasma to be used um, for patients who are newly acutely unwell with um, COVID-19. Um, so this has been a, a kind of intervention of great interest around the world, and there's been a number of clinical trials around the world looking at convalescent plasma. The majority of these studies, well, of the ones that have been reported now, uh, would suggest that convalescent plasma doesn't work uh, in the acute setting, and in particular, the recovery study from the United Kingdom, which um, we've all been looking to for, for answers around multiple interventions, but they ended up recruiting 10,000 patients um, and re randomizing those to convalescent plasma or no convalescent plasma. And unfortunately, this showed that uh, mortality rates were the same in both arms, so 18% and 18%, so absolutely no difference. Based on those results um, and the low likelihood that ASCOT, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, would add anything more to this scientific knowledge of whether convalescent plasma works or not, um, the ASCOT trial steering committee decided to close uh, the convalescent plasma arm of ASCOT. Um, we felt that um, even though there are no real safety concerns with using convalescent plasma, that there is still you know, very, very low risk of transfusion related adverse events. And there's the additional burden of sample and data collection for these patients um, with um, you know, very minimal chance that they'll have benefit. So based on those things, we decided to close convalescent plasma as an intervention. The new thing that we're going to bring in is a drug called nefamistat. 
Uh, most will be less familiar with nifamostat. It's a drug that's been licensed for use in Japan and Korea for other conditions such as pancreatitis. So it has a, a good safety profile. We've, it's been used for you know, thousands of patients. But maybe some surprisingly, FAMSTATs had been found to have action in blocking a protein called TMPRSS2 in human cells. Now, this TEMPRS2 is a critical protein that allows SARS-CoV-2 virus to enter into human cells. You will have heard lots about the ACE2 receptor, um, which the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 binds to, to attach to human cells. Um, what's less well known is that this connection between ACE2 and spike protein needs to be cleaved for the virus to enter the cell. So basically that the virus kind of attaches via spike um, and ACE2, you need to cleave that connection to allow the virus to roll in and enter into the cell. And this cleavage is done by the protein TEMPRS2. Nifamostat blocks the action of TEMPRS2. And so this has a very potent effect in um, preventing the release of SARS-CoV-2 and entry into the cell. And actually it's been found to be highly potent um, in inhibiting viral replication in laboratory studies and much more potent, even 100 times more potent than remdesivir, which is the only approved antiviral medication that's been shown to have benefit in patients with COVID. So we're kind of pretty excited about bringing this on board. It's, it's, it's a drug that can consistently achieve levels in the blood above that needed to, to inhibit viral replication. Uh, the main downside perhaps with nifamstat is that it's quickly metabolized in the body and so it needs to be given as a constant intravenous infusion. Um, so this sounds pretty complicated, but in fact, it's a bit like giving an intravenous drip of saline over a 24 hour period. And we're very, very uh, familiar and used to doing this for patients in hospitals. We're collaborating with a Korean company and with the Institute Pasteur Korea to obtain the drug. And it's now been shipped to Australia and we're in the process of distributing it to sites in Australia and getting these sites prepared for including nefamostat. So I'll stop there, Rebecca, but we're very happy to take questions around um, any of the things we've discussed. Natasha Robinson from The Australian um, has asked if nefamostat's being studied in any other clinical trials. Thanks, um, Natasha. It's, it's one that seems to have slipped under the radar a little bit, actually. Um, so. None of the really big clinical trials like um, uh, the recovery trial are currently testing the famostat. And so we think that there is a bit of a niche here uh, where it's not being in you know, these large phase three trials. And uh, we, we've been in some ways burnt in the past by testing things which other trials have also tested. Um, and we're hoping that there is some novelty to, to looking at nefamostat. Um, it may be that, you know, preliminary findings, even from our study, could then drive larger studies to look at it in greater detail. Um, so that's part of the, the, the kind of novelty is part of the reason why we're excited. There are a small number of studies which are looking at it, but, but they're, they're small and probably similar in size to, you know, not to ours, that they'd be smaller than ours. Matilda Bosley from The Guardian. Um, apologies if this has already been answered, but what is the total number of drugs now used in the trial? Will all be used across both Australia and India? Um, thanks, Matilda. Uh, so um, if I kind of uh, get your question correctly, the kind of number of interventions that we're looking at in the trial uh, will include, we have these what we call different domains. So one of the domains is to look at blood thinning medications or anticoagulation. We're also looking at antibody therapies, a bit like you know, your monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma, or in India, we're hoping to introduce something called hyperimmune globulin. Um, and then there's the third domain, which is these antiviral drugs. Now, you'll be aware that in the past, we've, we've um, closed uh, hydroxychloroquine and lipinavir, ritonavir, which were these HIV, the HIV drug, um, and now we'll be testing nefamostat. So we're hoping that nefamostat will be available in both Australia and New Zealand and India. Um, we have the appropriate drug approvals for importing to Australia at this stage, and we're working to get those approvals um, uh, obtained in India as well at the moment. Thanks, Steve. Natasha's got another question. She's just wondering how Nefamostat's action against SARS-CoV-2 was first discovered. Look, from, from my memory, if this serves me right, uh, there's been, all, you know, uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, people wanted to test all kinds of drugs in the laboratory to see what might have activity against um, SARS-CoV-2. And so there's been these very broad screens of, you know, anything in your, in your laboratory or the freezer uh, that 
potentially might have activity against SARS-CoV-2. And this was one of those that had a very clear hit to show that it was very potent in the laboratory in, in preventing viral replication. There's an analog of nefamostat, an oral version, a tablet form uh, called camostat, which is being tested in, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, and obviously we are, we are testing the intravenous formulation in the ASCOT trial. I might ask a follow-up question there on Kefamistat. So why did you choose uh, Kefamistat over the oral version? Yeah, good question. Um, obviously, an oral version has great attractions in that it's much easier to, to use and to give. Uh, when we looked at the data comparing Nefamstat and Camistat, Nefamstat was, you know, an order of magnitude more potent. Uh, so it was clearly of all the kind of agents that we've we've considered bringing into Ascot, uh, it was clearly the most potent, um, meaning really that you needed the lowest concentrations in the laboratory to be able to um, inhibit viral replication. And so we thought um, in our trial, we wanted to just go for the, the one that had most likelihood of having an effect. Will this trial include only people who have not received that vaccine? Uh, no, so, so we, we want to include all comers who get sick enough um, to be hospitalised with COVID, regardless of whether they received the vaccine or not. We will collect data on whether they received a vaccine and which vaccine that was, um, because obviously that, that's important to knowing that their immune response, um, but we're going to include all comers. So if it ends up, you know, for example, that the vaccines in real life are a little less effective than in the trials, or, and even if they're, you know, 95% effective, that still means 5% of people will still get COVID or would, would, not that 5% of people will get COVID, but, but the um, risk of COVID is still there. Um, and, and so if they're sick enough to be hospital, we still want to be able to provide treatments for those patients. Uh, obviously, we've just opened in India. Are there any plans to open any other international sites? Yeah, I can answer that one as well. We are actively looking for partners. Um, we, we have uh, made some headway there with uh, partners in Denmark. Uh, and so we are um, going through the regulatory procedures and ethics procedures to again, try and open some sites in Denmark as well. But we're, we've been trying to reach out to colleagues around the world. Understandably, you know, many places already have trials up and running or are contributing to other different studies. Um, and uh, sites and countries don't want to duplicate those efforts, um, but we have been uh, reaching out to connections that we have.